Hello there. I am Dean Walker here with uh, the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And also, this will be uh, an episode of our special focus interview series called Take My Hand Conscious Parenting in a Time of Stolen Dreams. And this special interview series is um, only occasionally going to be showing up in the YouTube channel for Poetry of Predicament. So if you're watching there, I'd like to just draw your attention to where the rest of the series, there's a tremendous amount of um, in-house interviews like this one that are stacked up to be included in this Take My Hand series. There's also a lot of support media, other videos, articles, support, uh, everything from music to comedy uh, that will support this conversation, this um, unfortunately rare conversation for people who are both parents and collapse aware. I've also found it tremendously uh, valuable to be a part of this series and to to actually watch and and listen to this series. And I am not a parent myself. It's been uh, of tremendous value to hear these parents and uh, from all walks of life uh, share what they do to stay grounded, to stay connected, to stay Uh, in a preferred state of being, sometimes it's called self-regulation or co-regulation in their own family, um, in the face of just a wild and crazy world out there. In addition to the fact that they, like so many of us who are collapse aware, uh, suffer the same kind of isolation when they do, from their own friends, their own family members. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of value, even if a person is not a parent. So um, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to at the the website, which is livingresilience.net, and to go to the programs page, which is also called Deep Academy page, And uh, this will be one of the items that you can register for, sign up for. And in good gift economy fashion, you can choose your level of financial support for this offering, like all the other offerings in the Deep Academy programs page there on the website. Uh, I think you're going to find it and the other elements of Deep Academy of tremendous value. We're gonna be having uh, more and more offerings, including not only the on-demand video learning series, but also many live uh, Zoom calls that will be part of a community of practice on the website and through the Deep Academy uh, learning series. And so, um, I'd invite you to join us, go check it out. Um, sign up for the first one, which is called living in two worlds. Sign up as while you're there for this, uh, long and ever growing series of take my hand conscious parenting in a time of stolen dreams. We've got our next, uh, series, showing up uh, in the first week of January here in the early few first few days of January 2020. And uh, we hope to see you as a part of these ongoing live support sessions and uh, all the information for each of these video series, each of these live offerings, uh, all of it can be found at the uh, the website address that's on the screen. So um, look forward to seeing you there. 
hope this is a, a set of offerings that is of tremendous value for you in this coming year. I know we can all use all the support we can get in the face of this kind of crazy world. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, this again is Dr. Reverend Ken Witt. And Dr. Reverend Ken Witt, I think he's going to be bugged by me repeating his name that way. But Ken Witt, I think you're going to find, uh, especially if you are in fact a part of a faith community yourself, he's uh, like Michael Dowd, who's been on this program a number of times. Um, a tremendous voice for new possibilities of having the faith community and the collapse aware community intersect in a significant way, which is a real relief for me from the, the polarization that's occurred in these, uh, especially the past decade or so with the evan evangelical community in particular, along with the environmental and collapse aware communities. So, um, I invite you to enjoy this intersectional conversation with Ken Witt. Um, again, a la the, uh, the tone and content of our many conversations with Michael Dowd. Um, enjoy. I'm Dean Walker and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. As part of our ongoing series, Take My Hand, Conscious Parenting in a Time of Stolen Dreams, from the same lineage as our earlier guest, Michael Dowd, Reverend Dr. Ken Witt speaks with us about going to the roots of a faith community to encourage deep stewardship of earth, community, and parenting in the face of collapse. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Ken Witt. Anyway, um, I... I began to um, care about all of this a long time ago, but I wasn't very well informed. I had some kind of general idea uh, since, since uh, probably 82 um, that the world was headed for deep trouble. But when I got connected to Michael, Michael he put me in touch with uh, authors and books which I then began to read uh, like I was devouring them. I'm looking at Overshoot right now uh, uh, by William Payton Jr., which Michael says is the most important book written in the 20th century. I have no, no disagreement with him on that. And then he recommended one thing after the other and uh, finally put me on to an author named Kunstler who wrote a series of uh, novels. Let me see if I can... Uh, Oh, yeah, this, this is it. Um, World Made by Hand by James Howard Kunstler. And so I, I began reading all of this, and all of a sudden, I, I had information and knowledge uh, enough so that I could begin to imagine the necessity and the difficulty of, of sharing this with my children, of nurturing my grandchildren, of, of writing a book that focused specifically on, and the subtitle of my book is Ready Our Children to Find Hope and Be Love in a Future of Perils. And I have been uh, uh, critiqued by even using the word perils because, because for some it's, it's, it's just so difficult to move beyond the necessary education where we help our children and grandchildren live in harmony with the earth, uh, to then also then taking another little step which says like, this is not only just a good idea for us to live anyway, and we should have been doing this all along, uh, much better than we did it, uh, but 
it's, it's gotten to a point now where there are so many uh, systems and problems that are building up that, uh, that social and, and uh, societal uh, collapse are all but inevitable. Um, there have been some really interesting pieces written by terrific experts um, in, in these fields who have, who have portrayed kind of an, in, a, in an article or so, one was in Time Magazine, uh, what would need to happen between 2020 and 2050 to give us a fighting chance. But as you probably know, we're going backwards mm -hmm. on all the things that need to happen instead of forward on all of them. So we're talking about a near-term problem, uh, which then creates all kinds of tension for, for parents and grandparents and people who love kids. And um, how do we communicate and how do we, how do we build an honest hope and a, a deep commitment to, to love um, when, when there are so many perils? And of course, part of the answer is it may not be easy, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. our, our children merit that. We can't give them a perfect world. We weren't going to give them that even if the society continued, which it doesn't look like it can possibly. And, and, uh, and in some moral sense, it probably shouldn't. Uh, yeah. Um, well, Ken, I appreciate you, you giving us that, that kind of background and, and context. And I'm curious to just land it a little bit more on the personal side for you. What you were just saying is you've known for quite some time using a number of different, sounds like a number of different measures as you scan the world. And those measures have not been looking good for a number of decades now for someone yeah. as astute as yourself. And I'd say courageous as yourself, because it sounds like you have been in a faith community your whole life. You've been prominent in that faith community. Again, it just sounds like, I do, I'm not saying I know this, but it just sounds like it. And it sounds like you've taken a bold stand to, to name what you're seeing. And as basic as that sounds, my experience of some of the faith traditions, particularly in the USA, uh, that's actually taboo. To, to name what's actually going on could mean that one is ostracized from the community. So again, this is just from my ex external view. I don't pretend to know the inner workings, but in some, um, you know, per, for instance, and, and kind of notoriously in the, in the, in the evangelical community, um, it, one can be kicked out of the community or, or just shunned for naming what you've already named in this conversation alone, not to mention the details of why it's so urgent and so on. I'm curious if you would just take a moment to just share when you look out today and you see the shape we're in and you see that we are indeed backsliding, we're indeed you know, increasing our emissions and, and in so many other voracious ways we're impacting this planet. I'm curious when you just, you yourself, you can, not the author, just the grandfather and the father and the concerned member of a community, when you look out into the world, what are the things that really rattle you, that really concern you, that you're seeing? Well, there are so many places to go with that. I do want to do want to say that I, I have been an American Baptist pastor for 44 years. Um, I know evangelicals like Ken Wilson up in Michigan who led his congregation and his denomination into a deep caring uh, towards, towards the earth and, and the ecological issues. Uh, he got 
uh, expelled for another reason, because he welcomed and included uh, gay people, um, which, and wrote some really good books about that. Um, uh, I wrote a sermon in, in 87 called um, uh, The Corruption of the Womb of God. And, and uh, so I have gone back and looked at what I was doing for the last uh, 20, 25 years and realized that when I could, and it, to the extent that I knew what to say, I have been regularly dealing with the issues. But as of today, I want to I want to focus on one piece of what you just said. Um, my my wife um, loves, cares, and 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 finds healing relationships with animals uh, as much as anybody I know. And she is um, always encouraging the grandchildren in that love. And one of the families our families recently adopted a litter of kittens and and took care of the outside ones and brought one in to save its life and um but the story i want to tell is a story about my grandson maxton uh, maxton's mom was on a mission trip with her church uh, helping foster care uh, families in uh, south africa and uh, his dad was at work so my wife and i picked up the two children McKenna and Maxton took him to the Columbus Zoo, uh, did Africa, all kinds of cool things. We videoed a video from Africa to their mother in Africa. It was really a fun experience. This story is in my book. Um, and then we headed on from Africa and ended up over in, over in Asia, I think. And uh, we were looking at the snakes and all that, and the kids disappeared. And I went through this like momentary, like, what happened to the kids? Well, McKenna and Maxton had ended up on a couch where I could not see them underneath the edge of the couch. They were watching a, a video at the Columbus uh, Zoo. And the video was on all the animals that were being murdered, destroyed, uh, poached in Africa, the elephants and the tigers and the rhinos and, and all that. Um, and and when the video was done, I, I finally found them there sitting and I said, let's get going. And Maxton says, he's age four. He says, I'm not leaving. I have to watch this again. Oh, okay. So we stood there and watched this video. And it was to my wife, uh, incredibly painful to watch it. But there's Maxton, age four. And he, um, he asked me when the video finishes, grandpa, what can we do to help the animals? And so I said, we will get to the car, we'll go stop for ice cream, we'll talk about possibilities, which we did. I think we came up with like eight or 10 different things that, that children could do to help animals. And at the um, Thanksgiving of our family, the, uh, uh, about a month later, Maxton, age four, asked to say table grace. And he uh, prayed for, the animals and he told God that when he grew up he was going to be a scientist and help to save the animals and I mean the the, the kid handled the knowledge about how bad it is better than his grandparents did he went right from their suffering to I can do something about it and that's how I'm writing my book is, is to help parents and grandparents imagine how they can engage their kids uh, in whatever is needed to help them find realistic hope and to be love in a peril, future of great perils, even as they unfold in their very lifetimes. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, whatever is going on, they will find a way to have hope and to be loved no matter the circumstances. And that's the grounding that faith gives us. Uh, it, our, our love and our, and our hope is not dependent on what's happening to us that day. It has a deeper source. And so in my book, I'm, I hope to lead, well, actually what I mostly hope for is to be, build a conversation with many, many, many parents and grandparents out there who are already very concerned. They're 
ones that'll pick up my book and read it. If they don't think there's any problem, if they're denying climate change, they'll look at my book and just go, bye, see you around, not interested. But almost every grandparent I talk to is already asking the questions about how do I, how do I help my kids, my grandchildren? There's so much passion around that. And so I, I hope to build a community of folk that are, that are able to uh, support each other and help each other as we go about that, that uh, high calling in our lives. Yeah. Well, I, I've got to tell you, uh, Ken, this, this is really exciting to me. Um, I, I don't think I'll ever, I, I don't want to speak in nevers, but I, you know, I'm just not built, it seems, for what seem to be the traditional um, structures and forms of, of ver various religious opportunities around the world in different faith tr traditions. But I, uh, I've, I've got to say that there's been a, a real affinity that's been growing for me. As uh, I named my book two years ago, I named it uh, The Impossible Conversation. Yes. Uh, choosing resilience and reconnection at the end of business as usual. And I've been having many, many impossible conversations with people from all different traditions and cultures and, and walks of life. And some of the most fruitful, some of the most inspiring and, and uh, actually bonding conversations I've had have been with people so very different from myself, often from a fundamentalist brand of, of religious experience uh, in the USA. And where we found common ground was when I would describe this uh, experience of, of reconnection with the web of life. You know, just briefly about that book, why I called it The Impossible Conversation is I, I basically kept asking, how did we get into this awful situation? How did we get here? And the answer kept coming back that we've disconnected. And I, I've come down to the fact that we've dis disconnected from all the primary sources of meaning in a human life. And I would describe to these folks in these impossible conversations, I would describe to them uh, my experience of my doing my practices for reconnection. And all too often, what that would end up being is a, um, a feeling of oneness, a feeling of, of a, a larger and larger experience of self far beyond the personal or personality side type of self. And uh, <clears throat> the, the word that kept being used as they would share with me their similar experiences is grace. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm using that word now just from their suggestion, and uh, it's, it works just fine. I felt just a, a wee bit of that grace when you were describing your now fairly frequent experience of these grandparents saying, help, help me here. I want to be of service to these children. I hear and I feel and I, and I have great desire to be of service to these children so that they can look forward to a more vibrant life because it's not looking so good right now. Yeah, right. And so there's, there's some grace there. And I, first, I want to thank you for sharing that story about those elders who are being that way. Mm -hmm. I'm also in, in lots of conversations with older people from lots of different walks of life. And I got to tell you, there's, there's really not a lot of inspirational stories coming from the average person who just happens to be older yeah, and being right. older is not being an, an, an elder, a conscious elder. Mm -hmm. The people you're just describing seem like they're actually conscious elders. So I'm curious, 
you've you've really it seems like you've really honed in on having this book that you you uh, keep mentioning. I'd love it if you would speak a little bit more. Like, what is this book? Is this something of a tool that we might, that that a person might use to to clarify how they could be of service to these other generations and to the other community members. It seems like you're headed in a direction with that. And I'd love for you to say more about why did you write this book and what, what's the point of it? Yeah, Dean, I've been, I've been working on the theme of spirituality and science and then focusing on sustainability and uh, climate science uh, only uh, been working on the whole thing for about, really hard and focused for about two years and about a year specifically on on those issues related to uh, uh, climate science and sustainability science and read read prolifically and had tons of conversations with people. Um, I, I want to add that it wouldn't surprise me if we talked more about religion if I have as much or more trouble with religion and its role here as you or anyone uh, could possibly have. Uh, there, uh, we are off, off the charts in the wrong direction so, so much of the time. Um, however, the story that our children need to learn about the creation, about the purpose of why we're here on this earth is a spiritual and a science story. And what Michael Dowd and others are, are saying is that those two stories can be woven into one Mm -hmm. and help uh, our children understand and everybody understand the purpose. I mean, Tom, Thomas Berry and others and uh, call this the great story or the universal story. And there's some wonderful children's books. And one of the things I hope to do in the book is just provide many resources and, and pointers for, uh, for books that are out there. But I also am writing the, the entire book from the point of view of, of, of giving illustrations and examples of exactly how we engage our children and grandchildren in these conversations. The songs we write to sing with them, the activities we plan to do with them, the stories that we create together, the ways we modify the standard prayers of the day. Here's a really good example. I hope I remember it and don't make a fool of myself. Our table grace with the family when we gather as an extended family is um, the Johnny Appleseed prayer. Oh, the Lord is good to me. And so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. The Lord is good to me. And then we all go, amen, 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 amen. At Thanksgiving, we created a second verse. We too can plant some seeds that grow to apple trees. So Oh, even many years from now, children will know exactly how the Lord cares for their needs. And we've been doing that with all the prayers. We've been adding verses and prayers that focus on, on what we do to change the future or how we have love and hope even when things are going very badly. So there, there are ways that we can all learn. And, I, and there's people out there that know how to do this better than I do and are writing great songs. And, and by the time the book is published, I hope there's, well, there will be a, a web page and a conversation and various ways to invite anyone to become part of sharing. And there'll be this community building that's, that's gonna make it possible for a lot of grandparents and a lot of parents, a lot of teachers uh, to, um, to love the kids and help them find hope no matter what comes next. It's really, it's really possible to do that. That's part of the grace that you were uh, just talking about. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I grieve uh, lots of days. I, I, I grieve mightily and, and have to take that, those feelings into prayer. And some days there's ang a lot of days. There's, yesterday was a day of anger. Um, which was precipitated, by the way, by my wife and I talking about uh, how much of the biomass of the planet that is animal life is already gone. And I learned those, those numbers and focused 
focus from you on, on your show on a previous uh, broadcast. And, and, and we spent days learning more about that and processing it and, and grieving and deciding what we were going to do to care for the animals. And yeah, that's yeah. another story. Um, so I don't know what to say right at this moment. I'm, I got really deep into my feelings about this. So why don't you say something? Yeah, actually, um, you, you've watched enough episodes, you probably know by now that I, uh, I'm renowned for my pauses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm inclined to not, not move on into more content right now. Mm -hmm. It seems like you happen to have just touched for a moment a spot that, that is real and deep and important for you and and you taking that moment to be vulnerable and to share that with us i i just want to acknowledge it and and thank you for that you know there are times when i get so in the flow of this conversation and i'm in it every day all day and i can forget that we're actually talking about life on this miraculous planet and the web of life and its intricate intimacy in every cell of our bodies. And so when we slow down from the workaday world and the business as usual world and allow ourselves to really feel what's going on, those are precious moments. So I, I appreciate you doing that, and thank you for doing that. Uh, when you were speaking a little bit earlier, I opened up um, uh, the current draft of my book, and I, chapter 17 is titled, What Love Requires. And the primary answer to that question is something I'd like to share. Uh, the primary answer about what love requires and what it means to really love our kids and, and, and to be prepared for the future. Uh, probably most of your listeners know what prepping is and, and uh, maybe some have gone to prepper sites. In order to do my research for this, I've gone and examined some pretty cool and pretty scary prepper sites. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've found that is so amazing because it, it confirms everything I've been experiencing personally and, um, and everything that the really good writers on these topics tell us is that, you know, if you think storing some food away is a good way to prepare, by all means, if, you know, do what you can. Water, do what you can. Um, I think the most important things are, are that we nurture the spiritual values of hope, grace, love, faith. Um, but if there are things that help you feel like you're doing something to be prepared, by all means, do them. But then, then I, I keep reading information from the preppers themselves when they are, are, are reading in the, wet, in the uh, prepper site uh, of the, the, the fear of, of, of a particular person, their confusion, what do I do next? I only have so many resources. And let me, let me read you this. This is from a prepper that I've named Peter. The best way to keep your family safe is to get to know your neighbors. Not only is this always the right thing to do, love your neighbor as yourself, it is also the best way to get through any and all crisis. Neighbors who already care about each other are far more likely to work together if there is a widespread power outage or other emergency. If it comes to protecting your family, you might have all the weapons in the world, but you would still need to sleep. And he goes on, and, and that's just one, one little example out of many that I've found. Most of the people who look at this deeply say, build community. And so primarily my chapter 17 is, is, is about that theme, and community can be developed in, in many, many forms. I've read about extended families, all selling their homes and moving to a particular city area so that no matter what happens, they're closer. 
Uh, it's not going to solve the problems of the world, but that's what they've decided to do. Some have bought up a farm. Uh, some are already in communities like uh, uh, like uh, the Bruderhof uh, communities. I know Christian, a Christian community in the inner city in Cincinnati. Uh, anything we do to live the way we should be living already with neighborliness at the center instead of consumption at the center of our lives. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I would just challenge and want to converse with, with folk about what's the next right thing you can do to live the way we ought to be living anyway, which is in neighborliness, in community, in partnership, with others. How can we build that into life right now and, and help us to prepare for a future? So there are, there are so many good ways to respond. And, and, and then in feeling this kind of hope and being loved with others, that's how we nurture our children to, to, do, to do and be the same, no matter how quickly or slowly things proceed. Yeah. Well, you've, you've landed us in a very familiar place uh, for me. When I talked about the, uh, the four different kinds of disconnection that I've articulated in my own yes. book, in my own right. layout of stuff, the disconnection from deeper self, from others, from earth, and from soul, the, the one that keeps showing up the most dramatically, like the biggest missing chunk. They're all missing chunks, and they all have immense cost. Mm -hmm. uh, that it could be, you know, we could do literally a hundred shows in a row about this and not cover it all. But the, this one keeps showing up, and that is that we are so desperately disconnected from other people, mm -hmm. and that they're this is not an intuitive skill set. You know, in the USA in particular, which is really all I can speak about with any real experience, is that we, we have become deeply disconnected, polarized, and, and in some cases, more than that. I'm, I'm appreciating that you've apparently found a similar importance for that reconnection yes it might absolutely. look a little bit different it might have a slightly different form but you're i i absolutely resonate with what you're pointing at <clears throat> i just want to mention in one of my um le interviews last year i had the privilege of talking with a a futurist and a regenerative human systems designer named um Joe Brewer. And, you know, Joe Brewer's the kind of guy who's designing systems for people in this next chapter of humanity, hoping for against hope that we can find a way to live successfully and truly sustainably. And, uh, you know, I asked him, what is that the concerned person going to need? What kind of inner skills are we going to need to be able to participate in this new experiment that you're pointing at. And his quick answer was, they're going to need advanced self-regulation skills, and they're going to need a psychological flexibility. And he, we teased it out later, and, and I've heard him in other interviews really putting more flesh on the bones of that. And um, I'd, I'd like to just explore with you the, the, the couple of those the, those couple of branches of the conversation. One is that the whole idea of self-regulation is the idea that there is this preferred state of being that each of us knows. We might not talk about it much, but we know when we're in it. We know when we're in good shape. You know, we've got the ability to be flexible and to be interested and curious and connected with others and, and maybe even have a little sense of humor and you know we we know we're in good shape inside and the whole idea of self-regulation is 
when we're knocked out of that state of being by whatever it is. And it looks like today we've got larger and larger stressors that want to knock us out of that optimal state. So the idea of self-regulation is the ability that we craft individually and hopefully with kindred spirits in circle that we can uh, craft the skills of getting ourselves back to that optimal state fairly, you know, fairly quickly. Quickly, yeah. Right. And to be able to move forward together, even if we've been knocked, you know, really knocked hard by life. It's a whole different conversation about the psychological flexibility. That might be a different conversation, especially in contrast in a faith-based community as opposed to one that has, you know, kind of a psycho psychological focus and so on. Let's focus for just a moment on this idea of self-regulation and also the word uh, of co-regulation, like when we get have the opportunity to, to bring ourselves back to a good place with others. And I'm curious if that sparks you to say anything about your own family, your own practices, your own wow. faith community. Do you have anything to say about that? Oh, Dean, you ask such great questions. And um, wow. Um, okay, so my wife and I in our retirement did something we wanted to do all along, but we had to make a living and couldn't do it. We formed, we created a spiritual formation ministry. And, um, and that, that formation, that learning how to pray, that learning how to meditate, that learning how to give the pain and the suffering of our lives over to Christ, and then, and then go on in that space that you just described is, is exactly um, the, the way I'm, I and my wife are both actively seeking to live. For example, <laughs> okay, so Sunday morning, I, um, I was reading the news and learned that because of policies that are partly the fault of the United States government, there are now 240,000 more war refugees in Syria pouring out somewhere, trying to find some place. Children, women, old, elderly, maybe a few men, but most of the men have already been killed. So you're probably dealing with just a whole bunch of very vulnerable people. And I was so upset about that. And, and, it, 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 and it's just one piece of how things are going to go. I mean, we're going to be looking at situations uh, of war displacement and all kinds of other climate catastrophe, uh, dislocation of populations from climate chaos. So, so I go to church and I am so pleased that the text for the day is the slaughter of the innocents by Herod, who, who heard about this Jesus and thought he had to get rid of him to protect his power. Herod was, and the Roman Empire, were the principalities and powers of evil in their day. And they're going to slaughter the innocents. And I said, oh, I need to hear a sermon about that today. And then it didn't happen. It, it simply was the preacher was in a different place, went in a different place, and left me so angry. And I tried to deal with it. My wife and I talked about it, but I was so angry. And I went to the store the next morning to return some rotten food. And they said they wouldn't give me my money back unless I had a receipt. And I said, who keeps receipts for groceries? And, and, I, and I put the food on top of a cart and it fell off onto the floor and crashed down. And I just walked out of that store and turned back and said, this is garbage. And I was so mad. And I got in my car and I hit the highway and and it took me about three seconds to realize I wasn't mad about the food I mean I got so much food I got so many blessings like it's not the food it's the other stuff so I stopped down the road and and just went into prayer and and allowed myself to feel how angry I was and how sickening my stomach felt and the way I do it as a healing process is I just visualize turning that over to Jesus and, and just pulling my hands away. He takes it. He's got it. The rest of the day, things were, things were really good. 
I, I ran into some tough situations, but the anger was gone. You, you absolutely cannot make it in the world as it's coming to be if you don't have the resources, maybe from meditation, uh, maybe from conversation, wherever you get them from, that allow you to be resilient and adaptive and, and faithful and hopeful even when stuff is tough. So the spiritual answers and the building of community, which is, see, the best place to learn how to, how to let go of that hurt is, is with other people in community. Everything that we need to be about can't occur except in community. And, and whether you're talking about having the people with the right skills, some to make shoes, some to cook, some to build fireplaces outside, some to uh, take care of animals, uh, whatever, you, you, you can't get those by one person. So community and small town life becomes really the only sustainable possibility. Uh, but nonetheless, whatever is necessary, and even if we don't, individually make it to that next step it's the right way to live it just is the right way to live and provides the only kind of environment where we can where we can uh, safely reside in difficult times and we should be doing it now but if there's a if there is a, a terrible darkness to our culture it's that we are focused on the, the, the value of consumerism and separation from others and not focused on neighborliness and community. Um, that and all the skills and gifts we need to have for living with resiliency are, are, are going to be developed best in community. That's simply the way it is. And right this moment, it's the right way to live. And it always has been. Yeah. I have this naive part of me. I have this, you know, I've had it since I was a little kid. And I, I while it's made life a bit difficult uh, from time to time, I'm, I now find myself really holding it as very a dear part of me. And that, that naive part of me is uh, really enjoying, really appreciating these uh, self-regulation and co-regulation suggestions and stories that you're, you've just been recounting yeah. for us. Um, I, I really want to, you know, that, that naive part of me really wants to step into uh, what Charles Eisenstein likes to call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Um, I've got to say that I'm, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, it, it, things aren't looking good from my point of view, as you now have probably heard too much of in the various podcasts you've listened to. Um, but there is something, something that I, I touched into when I became involved with uh, Jem Bendel and his deep adaptation forum and deep adaptation community right. online. And I, I hear it in your stories as well, that it, it really is a time for presence and for relationship. And it is, it also appears to be a time for releasing our attachment to outcome. Like none of us really knows where this is going to go. And on some days, again, just to recount, to show you my hand, um, on some days it does not look good. Like within my old guy lifetime, I'm going to see massive, yes. massive die off and suffering. And on other days, um, I, I am so deeply thankful for my access to that state of grace that we've been talking about. You know, without it, I think I would not be alive to do this podcast with you. So there's a, a beauty in that naive part of me, that, that w wishful, hopeful, magical thinking part of me. And I'm, I'm curious, 
because I, I actually hear between the lines and what you're sharing, Ken, I hear that you, you actually have a sobriety that you're carrying with you too. And I, I know that I do as well, that, that things are looking pretty rough. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd like to ask you as, as we look at, at um, you know, kind of winding up our time together in this conversation, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could share some of what has been valuable for you in this um, remarkable life you've been describing to us, you know, with relationships like yeah. the one with Michael Dowd that you're describing and, and all of your history and experience. I'm wondering if you could share some, I don't think I'm quite asking for advice, but I'm asking what could you share with someone who's new to this, this bridge, crossing this bridge from this world that is so deeply troubled into something out ahead of us, something with heart, something with relationship, something with perhaps faith, something with uh, a, a deep appreciation of the sacredness of life itself. Could, could you share a bit, maybe a few of the gold nuggets that you've carried in your pocket as you've been crossing that bridge for quite some time now? You've, you've kind of been trailblazing in your own way. And I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit of what, that, what are those golden nuggets that you've carried that have helped you keep the faith, so to speak? How to, how, what's kept you getting out of bed in the morning and being a contribution to your family and to your community? Yeah. Well, I, I, really, I really know what I need to say. I hope I can get it out in a way that um, other people can, can get a handle on. R- remember that as I was writing, trying to write the second title, the secondary title of my book, I chose Ready Our Children to Find Hope and to Be Love in a Future of Perils, which is to say we're in trouble. And, and uh, our kids are, are going to suffer more if they can't find hope and be love in the future. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways that we can nurture that. But the beginning title of the book is God is Just Love. In order to say that, I have gone through a spiritual journey uh, on purpose. I mean, where I've really been paying attention to it that began in 1981, where I first began to learn to have a personal walk relationship with God. And I, I wrote a book in 2011 called uh, um, The Extraordinary Ordinary Uplifts Us Halfway to Heaven. And uh, Dean, it's, it's just a collection of, of stories, of God stories, of times in my life when I have been rescued or guided. And I, I wouldn't be up in the morning, and I wouldn't even do the next right thing, or if, if on, a, on an almost daily, uh, many times some days, I, I give, give the fear away and remember that God is just love, that at the beginning of time, there was just love spiritually spinning out there in the universe. Christians call it the Trinity to indicate that love is always a relationship, and then, and then, this big bang occurred 13.77 billion years ago. And, and that big bang was full of something, maybe energy, but it was full of love from my point of view. It was Christ from my point of view. And it went out to bring everything into being. And that's what there is in the universe until conscious entities begin saying no to love. And then evil builds up around us. And so on, and that's a that's a, I had have to explain a lot more to really make that clear to people. But fundamentally, I have been convinced by hundreds, maybe thousands of experiences, that God is just love. God is always on our side. But that does not mean things turn out the way we want to, and it does not mean that we can't wreck 
this beautiful world that we've been given. We can. We can also make the next right choice and make it better. But we've made so many bad choices that it's going to be tough. And the love that brings everything into being, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop if I pass from the earth. It doesn't stop if my extended family isn't here. It just keeps on keeping on as love, bringing the next best possibility into being. And, you know, somebody like my wife, who's just like, she loves animals even more than she loves people. She will tell you that. And, and the, the very thought that the animals might have a better chance if we weren't here and the plants and the trees, we've done so much damage already, is, is a bit comforting to, to her. Uh, that, but it's the thing that's really comforting is just knowing that love, which brings everything into being and has been doing its thing for 13.77 billion years, love doesn't, doesn't end. That's what Corinthians, love Corinthians, first Corinthians, love does not come to an end, it just keeps on. And if a bunch of us um, who were born into this privileged society, and by the way, you and I didn't choose to live here. Most of the really good authors I'm reading, the ones that I really like, they don't blame anybody. I mean, how, given what we were given and, and the worldview we were given, we, <laughs> uh, we didn't know how to do any better. Uh, mm -hmm. But we also keep making terrible choices. Kind of like when Cain kills Abel, you know, God comes down and says, you don't have to do this, but Cain did it anyway. And then he did the next wrong thing by d denying it. And then, you know, people keep doing stuff like that. We keep making the wrong choices. And there are really good choices. So the way my wife and I are living right now that keeps us kind of emotionally afloat is we keep talking about, okay, what's the next right thing? What's the next right thing for us to do? No matter what happens, we're down to one car. We do not travel internationally on air, by air. Uh, we uh, buy milk in, in uh, uh, just uh, homogenized, uh, pasteurized milk, not homogenized in glass bottles from a farm. You know, we do, we have a list of lots of things we do and there's a bigger, much bigger list of things we don't do. Mm -hmm. but, we, but we tack them up on the refrigerator whenever we come up with one. And one of mine for the new year, if I have a resolution for the new year, it's to learn how to do hydroponic gardening. Mm -hmm. In the midst of writing my book, I'm, I'm actually going to find time to learn hydroponic gardening. Well, I, I actually might. Uh, Kathy is going to learn how to uh, weave cloth. Um, if I had my brothers with one of my grandchildren, I, I would uh, begin to uh, help him learn how to make stuff without power tools. You know, I, there's so many next right things that you can do that will you know, keep you, and every one that you do makes it easier to be hopeful or at least to feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to solve, it doesn't have to solve all the problems. It just has to be the next right thing. Yeah. And yeah. that's one of the factors that keeps uh, us afloat. Mm. I like that. The, the next right thing. It sounds like it might be the title of the next book in your series. <laughs> there, you never know. Uh, let me just tell you what the next right thing was yesterday. It was really, it was really kind of interesting. Um, I love to cook, and I love to cook too much, and then I put the leftover or whatever, the extra, into a, into a bowl or an oven pan, and I take it to somebody. I just do this on a regular basis, people where we live. Well, yesterday, I decided to drive drive the uh, 45 miles, I had an errand to run anyway, up to my daughter's house in Westerville, Ohio, and I brought her a pan of tur uh, tur turkey, turkey tetrazzini, and it was really good because we ate the other pan, and when I got there, this is the daughter that brings foster kids into her children. She's already got two one-and-a-half-year-old twin girls and then two of her own, and they had gotten a call about a very badly injured three-year-old. And they were being asked if they would take another child into their home. 
And I said, well, why don't I hang around and, and see if you need me to help out? And, and eventually I ended up leaving and just leaving the food. Well, I showed up at the right time with the food because I think they're at 3.30, they're gonna pick up the kid today. And, and um, uh, he becomes immediately part of the family. So now I have 10 grandchildren and I had nine yesterday and who knows tomorrow. Um, but I just had this inspiration, this feeling that I should make some food and take it to them. I didn't know they were gonna get another kid. You never know when you do a random act of kindness you know, just fill your day with random, a random act of kindness here or there. It's just a great way to live. Mm -hmm. On, on uh, Christmas Eve day, I, uh, I, uh, we buy our coffee from a group called Equal Exchange. So I got uh, 20 pounds of Equal Exchange coffee that supports uh, mothers, single parent mothers who live in Guatemala and raise coffee. And I put a bunch of it in a, in a plastic bag and stuck a card in that tells all about it. And I started delivering them to neighbors. And if they weren't there, I just left it. And pretty soon on, on our Facebook posts, I got these, who's the Santa Claus coffee bean giver person? You know, it's, it's like, I did that that day because I was feeling stressed. And I don't know, just wasn't feeling good about life. And by the time I got done delivering coffee beans and telling people about equal exchange, I was having a great day. Fill your days with love mm -hmm. and, and it changes everything. And keep, keep your eye out for the next right, right thing. Ken Witt, um, I'm wondering if you could recap for us some of the things that you've been saying about how to get a hold of you and oh, okay. the nature of this book that you're going to be releasing. When does the book come out? Well, I assume that you can put some written details in the uh, information oh, yeah. that follows the, the, the podcast. Oh, yeah. um, the book is coming out in mid-2020. Uh, exactly when depends on how much inspi inspiration comes and how much more research I decide to do uh, as I'm finishing up chapters. Uh, I have, an, I have obviously an email address, and, and if people want to receive the newsletter that we send out quarterly on, on growing spiritually, I would send that to them, obviously no cost, they just have to get me their email address. So the easiest way to do that is to send me an email at drkenwitt at gmail.com, D-R-K-E-N-W-H-I-T-T at gmail.com and I will begin sending you those newsletters and I'll put you on the list to get updates about the book which uh, God is just love ready our children to be find hope and be love in a future of perils uh, will be published by read the spirit books mid next year uh, and um, I have a separate mail email list uh, group that I'm sending updates on the book. So I will, anybody who sends me their email, I'll put them on that list. Great. Before too long, there'll be a web page, and and because the ultimate goal is to create a community that talks about these things and feeds me with ideas and 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 helps to all, help all of us find hope and be loving people in the midst of whatever's happening. Yeah. Well, um, can I just? Uh... <sighs> I want to want you to know that you're going to get a, a pretty prime spot in this uh, special podcast series. Uh, it actually is going to be a part of my website that people will be going in. Uh, you may want to do this now. It's, it's different than the Poetry of Predicament podcast, which is a YouTube channel. Please, for all the viewers, I, I would very much appreciate it if you would sign up for, you know, subscribe on YouTube to the Poetry of Predicament. You'll still get the occasional update of this Take My Hand, Conscious Parenting in a Time of Stolen Dreams. You'll still get the occasional update and, you know, the occasional interview will show up there. But where you will get all the materials all the interviews, all the support materials um, is there on the website. And again, I'm, I'm going to include this also in the show notes below. 
but basically it's you know going to the website going to the programs page signing up for access to all of these resources in the take my hand series and i'm going to be putting you right next to michael dowd's location because he was also interviewed for this parenting yes. series <clears throat> and uh I'm, I'm particularly happy that <clears throat> we have the two of you and a, and a couple of others come to mind, folks who have a, a deep anchoring in a faith community, yet also are willing to stare s straight on, face, face forward into this predicament-laden world that we've got going on. And to, you know, share what are some of the unique challenges of being collapse aware and a parent and someone who is coming to terms with what it is to hold this world in a frame of faith with both of those experiences going on. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have you there, to have Michael uh, Dowd there, and uh, to be holding that space and to be sharing the practices and the, the distinctions that you have in that, in that particular quality of faith that you carry. Um, I'm hoping that this will be useful for people yeah, who yeah. are in that same neighborhood, you know, so to speak. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to get to know you and um, really a pleasure to, to hear how engaged you and your wife are. Um, and, and I was particularly moved by you sharing the uh, other elders in your life who have been reaching out and asking for help how to be of service to the young people in their lives. I, I want to now clone all those people and, and have them somehow spread around the world. Um, it's, it's been uh, inspiring. And uh, I also appreciate the, uh, the vulnerability that you brought today, Ken. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap it up? Yesterday, I went to another site of yours. Uh, was it? Did it have the word resilience in it? Yeah, my, my website is called livingresilience.net. Yeah, that's where I went, and I just wanted to tell you again, uh, that's, that is fabulous. You're just, it's such a great resource, and, and uh, um, you, have, you have really uh, been the, the place where I found a way to connect to others who care about their kids. Uh, before that, I was just finding little tidbits, and and when I when I found you and was able to listen to some of the mothers you were talking to, it was such a gift, and I I I'm very very grateful to you. <clears throat> well, thank you, yeah. thank you. The it big is resilience. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, um, I hope against hope. This is not our last chance to have a conversation like this. In fact, uh, as we were talking before we hit the record button, I'll look forward to uh, whenever it is that you're ready to promote that book coming out. Be more than happy to have you come back and tell us how it's landed and how it's uh, ended up, what form it's taken, and um, hear a bit more from your voice. Dean, you keep being a treasure in this new year and mm -hmm. uh, you'll feel good about it because you know you're making a difference yeah yeah happy new year thanks for watching another episode of the poetry of predicament podcast produced by dean walker and the living resilience alliance www.livingresilience.net music today from michael hedges as always and also port blue into the sea also available on our website www.livingresilience.net is a wide array of articles online learning series arranging group and individual resilience coaching and sign up for 
our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.